All right, so good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from everyone. My name is Jesse and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. For those joining us for the first time, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And of course, there are no classrooms right now. All of you are stuck at home except for some of our live families and classes today, so welcome into them. And so over the last month, you have been joining us on YouTube and we so appreciate it. We have done over 140 programs with scientists, explorers, and amazing facilities across the globe, all live on YouTube and all archived there for you guys to check out as well. Today, we are going back to one of our longest standing and, and most fun partners in OceanWise at the Vancouver Aquarium. So we are joined live there by Nicole. She is an educator and she is gonna share with us today a little bit about the story of marine plastics. This is one of the defining sort of issues of our time, something that is really close to home for a lot of people, literally and figuratively. We spend an entire month in September highlighting ocean plastics and it's really nice to bring it back now. Um, so without further ado, thanks so much for joining us today, Nicole, and take us away. Thank you very much, Jesse. So uh, hello everybody, my name is Nicole from the Vancouver Aquarium, as well as OceanWise. So if you recognize our logo here, uh, you might see us uh, in some seafood can or even some seafood product. And we do have um, organization here at Vancouver Aquarium to really do a lot of cons conservation and education work here. So uh, I'm really happy to share my knowledge, my experience, as well as uh, some of my experience here at the Vancouver Aquarium, which is the traditional land of the Coast Salish people. So they've been living here for thousands of years, and we're really happy happy to be here just to tell you a bit more about today's program. So our topic today is plastics. Uh, we have a lot of research uh, doing, uh, going on and talk about a lot of plastics pollution. And so we're going to dive into the topics and, <clears throat> sorry, and let you know about what's going on in uh, our organization, despite it is actually closed right now and try to think of some ways in order to protect our environment and try to take part in our plastic pollution uh, project so that we can save the world together. So are you guys ready? Fantastic. I'm ready to save the world, Nicole. Let's do it. Let's do it, yeah. So first of all, I would love you to take 10 seconds and look around the surrounding area and try to find what kind of products are actually made of plastics? So 10 seconds, look around and even look at yourself and try to find some plastic products. Cool. So I think you find a lot of plastic items around your house or even your room. And I've got some examples for you to see if we have things in common. So, first of all, we have plastic bags like this, like a Ziploc bag. Uh, it's really, really useful and it's transparent and you can carry it everywhere. It's made of plastics. And uh, you probably have some plastic bottles with you at home. Uh, if you like Cokes or even soft drink or pops, you might have something like this. Um, yeah, we do have plastic bottles and you have foam like these where you can put stuff inside and pack your stuff inside the box. Yeah, these are foams and they're very, very large. But if you have these and you try to tear it apart, you will find that they can actually break down into smaller and smaller pieces. So I have some foam like this. It's really, really large and you can put it as insulation materials or even protection for some of your valuables like this. But however, they can actually be very fragile and they can break and break and break into smaller pieces like these. So let's see if you can see those. So it's very, very small. It's very, very tiny that you might not notice them. And if you have stuffy, yeah, try to look for the, the tag that you have for a stubby like this. These tags are actually made from plastics and they can actually tear apart and become something that you might not notice as well. And a tiny gem is that if you take a look at the eyes of a stubby, 
that might be made from plastics as well. So plastics are everywhere, including your clothing as well. So a lot of clothes are actually made of plastic called nylon and they're durable and it helps you to having a like water resistant, waterproof a layer on your body so that when it's raining, you won't feel a lot of trouble around you. So it saves you a little bit of messy matter. Um, there's a lot of plastic around us and these plastics always cause problem for the environment. Um, we would say that for plastic, they're very useful in our daily life, but once being mistreated or they are being um, released to the ocean, it can cause a lot of trouble. So I'm going to show you my screen a little bit and I have some photos for you uh, to take a look at the real situation that's happening now here at Vancouver as, all, as, well, as well as around the world. <clears throat> so right here we have a water bottle with a lot of sand and there is a lot of animals that actually live underneath the sandy shore. And if you take a look, <clears throat> sorry, at the bottom of the uh, bottle, you will see there's legs and crabs underneath it, and they are forced to live together with those plastics. And for some uh, coastal area, there's a lot of fishermen trying to catch fish every day, and they leave a lot of fishing nets inside the ocean. And what's happened is that for seals and sea lions in the picture, they are trapped by those fishing nets and wrapping of uh, plastics. So they are restrained from growing bigger and bigger. And so if you take a look at this picture, you will see there's a plastic wrap wrapping around the sea lion's neck and actually affecting their activities. And after that, for some nets that sink into the bottom of uh, the ocean, they actually become a trap, a hidden trap to a lot of marine animals, such as the top feathers, sharks, they are being entangled by those fishing nets. And that is something that we, can, we wouldn't, wouldn't want to see it uh, in our future as well. So um, today we're going to talk a little bit more about plastic as well as how they affect uh, the animals in our ocean. So just now you know, saw a lot of macro uh, plastics like a uh, water bottle, plastic bags, or even something that you can touch or even you can feel it. But in our environment, that is not the most dangerous item. And from my experience or from my personal view, microplastics is actually something that is more dangerous for those animals. So for microplastics, they are really tiny plastic feet that you may not see them really, really clearly, just like um, the foam that you saw that break down into smaller and smaller and smaller plastics that is small, even smaller than your fingernails. And these tiny bits of plastics, they are called microplastics. And some of the body product that we are using every day, they contain microplastics as well, because um, some of the manufacturers, they think that if we put a lot of natural um, product that used to be a body scrub, um, it will affect their cost, they will make it even more costly and nobody will buy it. So they try to invent a lot of microplastics to replace the natural materials for body scrub so that they can make a large amount of those products and they can sell it at a very cheap price. So that's why we have a lot of microplastics. And I have a bottle of microplastics to show you. Let's see if we can have a closer look. So the yellow, yellow solution is actually with a lot of microplastics and we collect it from our freshwater habitat. And if you see those white tiny bits here, they are all microplastics. So uh, I'm not sure about the actual number of um, the microplastic right here, but I would say there will be a millions or even more microplastic inside this bottle of water sample. So these are the most dangerous items that we have in our environment. Um, they will try to, they will be uh, released into the ocean through the water system and through the water current. So 
some of you may think that actually it's not quite the matter with me and it's not related to me, but it's actually something we deal with every day. <clears throat> so try to think of your timetable rundown during your uh, stay home period and try to think of what is the chance that you try to use water every day. You will try to brush your teeth every day. You will try to uh, use body scrub or even body wash in order to make yourself cleaner. And you trying to wash your clothes maybe by yourself or maybe by your parents as well. So these are the actions that we release a lot of microplastics. So we have uh, toothpaste made with microplastics element. Uh, we have a lot of body wash, which contains a lot of microplastics. When we wash clothes, um, some of the fiber, the fabric will be really, uh, will be shredded and mixed with water and will release into the drains, which uh, eventually reach your wastewater treatment plant. And one surprising thing is that for those microplastics, they cannot be filtered inside a wastewater treatment plant because they are really tiny and our advanced technology cannot restrain them from releasing to the ocean. So those microplastics, they will try to release, they will try to follow the water current and discharge to the ocean. And what's happened to those microplastics is that they will be eaten by something that we might not recognize them. So I have a sample here and I want you to try to guess what are these. I can turn this to some of the live groups if you'd like, Nicole, to ask. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Savannah, well, we'll go to you first because you were the first one to join in live. Do you know what these guys are? <laughs> they look like little shrimp. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that correct, Nicole? Yeah, that's true. So they are actually samples collect from the Arctic. So they're actually grilled. So it's similar to shrimp. And they are actually at the bottom of the food chain because they provide a lot of nutrients. They provide a lot of energies for fish and eventually for beluga well as well. So I have my beluga stuff here, which they also have plastic, unfortunately. And imagine when we have microplastic released from our water treatment plant and they're eaten by those krill here, the stream-like animals. And those stream-like animals, krill, will actually be eaten by fish like cod or even uh, other bigger fish. And sharks, beluga, who actually feed on fish, they will consume a lot of microplastic. And those microplastic cannot be um, decomposed and they will stay inside those animals' body. And that's why inside the food chain, you will notice there is a flow of microplastic and it accumulates along a bigger animal as well. And if you take a look at the news right now, you will see there's scientific research saying that we found a lot of microplastic in our water as well as our drinking water, as well as feces of human and also other animals as well. So this is something we need to focus and try to learn more about them. And for our organization, OceanWise, uh, we are very, very um, interesting in knowing about uh, what are those plastics affecting uh, the animals around, especially for the uh, Arctic area, because um, they are really, really precious habitat for uh, a lot of animals. They actually control the climate and weather uh, for the whole uh, planet. So that's why we have to save those habitat as well as the animals in it as well. So our scientists here, they pay a lot of attention to microplastics uh, in the Arctic and they try to work with First Nation indigenous people as well. So I'm going to share with you some of the research uh, pictures that I have with me. And um, note that it will be a little bit gross, but yeah, it's part of our um, research that I want you to take a look at. 
So just now we talked about the beluga, uh, how they can actually get microplastics uh, from the water and from their food. And our scientists are really interested in knowing how much beluga whales are actually having their um, microplastic inside the body. So if you take a look at our scientists in yellow, uh, yellow suit, uh, you will see it it's actually she's trying to uh, find the stomach and also the tracks of the beluga and they collected them uh, from the First Nation community as well. So our First Nation community up north, they tried to donate eight um, beluga whales uh, stomach to us for uh, research and they also collect all the poop and they actually uh, from all eight samples, they all find plastic inside and then they try to do a lot of analysis and they also find microplastics everywhere uh, in Beluga's body. And that is really, really um, surprising because we never know that, oh, the Arctic is actually having a lot of microplastics around their region, as well as uh, it's very near to what um, the First Nations are living. And a fun fact for you is that for uh, First Nation, some of their main uh, protein intake are, is actually beluga's meat. And so uh, from there, if you take a look at the food chain, uh, the microplastic will reach beluga. And then after that, the beluga meat will contain microplastic. And that's why uh, some of our human feces, they can be, uh, some of the microplastic can be found there as well. So that is something we have to work on in order to know more about the composition of the, um, for the microplastic, as well as to know more about how they can actually get into the food chain. Um, apart from that, if we bring it back to a local context in Vancouver, uh, we do have another team of scientists who try to learn more about microplastics in their lab. So they try to learn about the microfiber that happened to be on our clothing. So they try to collect water sample uh, around Vancouver and then they try to use a lot of uh, machine and also operators in order to, to analyze uh, what are those microplastics. And most of the samples are actually from our clothing. And that's why they're trying to work with a lot of manufacturer and then also designer to get rid of all plastics uh, product and try to replace some um, materials uh, for clothes to be some natural one as well as uh, some eco-friendly one. So to change the whole dynamic of the industry, the clothing industry. And I want to show you an other research as well. That is uh, also from our, our uh, microplastic team. So what they do is they try to know, uh, they want to know about uh, what kind of microplastic and also the distribution of microplastics around the coastal area in Vancouver. So um, they try to put a lot of muscles and they try to raise a lot of muscles around Vancouver at different spot. Um, so what they do, uh, the reason why they want to put muscle is that they cannot move very quickly, they can collect very easily, and they are filter eater, filter feeder. So that means they're trying to use their uh, body to find a lot of nutrients, and they, these nut nutrients are so small, and they will try to filter it throughout uh, in the water and try to get all the micro um, organisms like plantains in order to get energy. So I'm going to show you a video about how um, muscle actually intake those micro organisms like phytoplankton and uh, other plankton as well. So bear with me for a sec. So here we go. So these are the micro, uh, these are the muscles. And then if you see something moving around, there are the plantains. And um, the my muscles would try to grab those plantain and in, have their intake of proteins every day. So they do it 24 seven in order to get the nutrients. And you can notice that they do not move really, really fast. They would try to stay there uh, maybe for the rest of the time. Yeah, 
And same as the microplastics. So if you take a look at the right hand corner, you can see there's small, tiny white dots there. And these are the microplastics. And it's even smaller than those plantain. And what's happened is that those micro, uh, those mussels, they cannot recognize those microplastics are something man-made. So they intake them right away as well as a filter, uh, filter feeder. Yeah. So what happened is that uh, when we try to find all the mussels and try to get them back to our lab and try to analyze them, they found a lot of microplastics nearby, especially for a coastal area near the city of Vancouver, because there's a lot of human activities down there. And then we have a lot of samples that have high concentration of microplastics. So it is not something that is localized in a city, but it's actually a global uh, issue, uh, not only from a little city of Vancouver, but also from the Arctic, from the US and also uh, from different parts of the world. So I myself is actually uh, from Hong Kong and Hong Kong is actually a coastal city as well. And there's a lot of different kind of uh, uh, marine litter floating around. Uh, I have seen like a cardboard or even uh, a fed refrigerator as well as some of the large like tires from sheep. Um, there's a lot of things because of the water current. So they move around because of the water current and reach some coastal area like the sandy shore or even rocky shore as well. So it's time for us to really think of some solutions in order to protect the environment. But before that, I would love to see if you guys have any questions before I jump into some solutions with all you. Fantastic. Well, thank you so, so much, Nicole. And from the YouTube comments, people are already coming up with solutions and sharing some cool ideas, which is awesome. Um, so we're about to dive into Q&A. I know we've got uh, Savannah in Annapolis, Maryland. We've got Miss uh, Palmer's class from Guelph. So for the students here, welcome in, everyone. Uh, I am going to come live to groups to take questions. If you have a question, you can let me know in the chat bar on the bottom. And then on YouTube, just let me know where you're joining from around the world. Share your questions, and we'll take as many as we can. But Nicole, I want to start with a question from uh, Ms. Peck. So she heard that there are concerns about plastic becoming sort of incorporated into animal tissues. Um, is that, you know, true? Is this something that we have to worry about, that plastic sort of embedded in our cells, we eat so much of it? Uh, or is this something that we see in animals? Can you just let us know about plastic being ingested and becoming part of us? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, at first, I thought that it's actually not a very good, uh, like, a, not a very big matter for me if uh, plastics are inside my body. But after I learned more about plastic, even I tried to do my own citizen science program, I found that it's not that easy or it's not that simple because for our microplastic, they are very small, but they have large surface area and they have a tendency of attracting a lot of toxic substance and they will attach to the surface of those microplastics. So because of that, we have a lot of toxic substance uh, 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 inside of my microplastic and it will pass through, um, pass along the food chain and eventually go to um, the uh, in pass, uh, uh, the tracks of the beluga whale, the larger marine animals, or even human as well. So imagine when you uh, look along the food chain, you will see those uh, toxic substances are actually accumulating as well. So some of this research actually show that for uh, accumulated toxic substance in plastics, they can lead to um, cancer, even a lot of uh, problems, health problems. And uh, from what my professor in Hong Kong trying to study is that they, they learned that um, the, uh, the substance inside plastic can uh, actually affect the gender of the newborn baby as well. So this is not something that uh, is um, very, very, uh, it's, a very, it's not a very small problem, but, but it can have a chain reaction of affecting a lot of things. Yeah, so that is a very good question. Fantastic. Thank you, Nicole. All right, I'm going to go to Ms. Palmer. Actually, you typed in your question, but we can go to you live and that's much more fun. So Ms. Palmer, if you want to share that question, uh, go for it. Thanks, Jesse. My question was actually about, well, I didn't realize that plastic was in so many household items such as toothpaste and body wash. How can we avoid not using the plastics that are in items such as that? It's not listed on the ingredient list, obviously, um, but is there a way to figure that out? 
Yeah, that's that is a very nice question. So, um, because uh, people are actually knowing more about plastic and they really concerned about the problem. So um, a lot of people are actually trying to ask those manufacturers to list all those uh, plastics ingredient in their bottle or in their packaging. Um, so if you take a look at the ingredients, you will see something start with poly, like polyethane, poly, uh, start with poly. So, so most of them are actually uh, plastic. So yeah, and also if you take a look at the tag, the clothes tag, you will see the line on as well. So they, they are all plastics as well. Um, and also you can actually try to search for an application for iPhone or Android phone um, that is called Beat the Micro Beats. So if you try to scan it on, on your scan a barcode on a product, you will try to they will try to analyze and try to search for that database and they will tell you uh, what are the ingredients and do they have any microplastic in it as well. Fantastic, thanks, Nicole. All right, I'm gonna to come to Savannah in just a second and then Kate, uh, but a question from a, a group joining in Montreal. They wanna know, is there any ocean or body of water that has more microplastics than others? Uh, is there a place that we find the highest concentration? Wow. Um, I will say for now, uh, scientists are actually trying to know and actually try to locate all the microplastic concentration as well because they are everywhere. They can move around with water current. Um, for, for me, I would say um, the, the discharge treatment plant that near a uh, coastal area will be having a very high uh, concentration as well because uh, this is the concentrated uh, discharge area of microplastic and also other waste. I would say that would be a lot, but eventually they will dilute with the water current and they will be everywhere. So I would say um, coastal area will be having a lot of microplastics, especially near the waste treatment plant. We've had uh, on a major marine plastics researcher from Toronto named Chelsea Rockman, and, and she did a thing in her presentation where she has, uh, you know, collected samples from oceans around the world and Lake Ontario. And interestingly, in oceans, it was about one in 10 samples or one in 10 marine organisms had plastics in them. But in the lakes, it was 10 out of 10. So it was absolutely everywhere. Major bodies of water that a lot of cities abut. Um, and so you, you get that sort of intense concentration. But I'm really glad we got that question. That's fantastic. All right, I'm going to come to Savannah now. If you have one, uh, come on up. Would there be a way to create some sort of like magnet with certain chemical that would attract the microplastics out of the ocean? Oh, I love the question. So as far as I know, I don't think there will be a magnet that can actually attract those microplastics, but a lot of scientists are trying to invent uh, some of the device in order to collect a lot of microplastics as well as some macroplastics inside the ocean as well. So some of the young scientists, they try to make like a sea bin, they try to uh, make those water current flow into the bin and then by that time they will have sieve or net to try to trap all those microplastics uh, as well as micro uh, the plastic items in one go but as far as I know they're trying to do more research on that because at the same time while we're collecting those marine litter they're actually trying to trap they accidentally try, try to trap all those plantains, which are nutrients and is also energy source for a lot of animals. So there's a lot of uh, inventions going on. And I know from Hong Kong, they're trying to make like a passive um, ban or a, a barrier so that they can trap all those large marine litter uh, in a passive way. But yeah, inventors are trying to do their best in order to know, do more research and try to invent something really cool. It's a really interesting time because I mean this field is fairly new. We only really have started researching this in a serious way in the last decade or so and we've recognized how big a global issue it is in the last one or two years and so this is something that labs all around the world are working on, governments all around the world are working on. So it's a really exciting time to see the developments in this field and to do what you can at home and you've already highlighted some of those which is fantastic Nicole. All right uh, Kate in uh, our class today wants to ask questions. So I'm going to come to you. Uh, you're demuted. Go for it. Uh, does microplastics affect any type of bigger fish? Yeah. Oh, um, it's actually affecting 
all kinds of fish. So no matter it's like uh, in the tropical area where there's a lot of like colorful fish or butterfly fish there, they are actually affected by those microplastics. Um, also from the Arctic up north, they have a lot of microplastics as well from the beluga research. And for me, I've been doing snorkeling everywhere in Hong Kong, and I've seen actually fish there eating a lot of plastics. Uh, if you take a look at those plastic straw, you will see like a diamond uh, bite, diamond shaped bite. They're actually caused by fish who mistake those plastics as their food and nutrients. Yeah, so I would say they're affecting all the fish. Cool. I mean, it's an unfortunate, but a, a great answer. And I'm glad we get that message out there. Thanks, Nicole. All right. We've got a bunch of questions coming in. You know what? In fact, in general, we are covering a lot of things around on our YouTube channel. But how can I help? This is the overarching question we're getting from everybody. What can I do if I don't live in a coastal region? How can I prevent mycoplastics from getting into the ocean? So as a general overview, uh, Nicole, is there things you can tell us that we can do at home? For sure, this is the most important things that we have to do every day. So um, I myself know um, the plastic problem for like four, five or six years or even five or six years ago or even longer time. So I start to do a lot of things to uh, try to uh, get rid of all the plastics and all of you can actually join me as well. So I bring all my things here today with me and I'm going to show you all my solutions in my daily life. So bear with me for a second. All right, so for the first one, for sure, I must have my water bottle every day. And uh, if, I, if I forget to bring it, I will feel uncomfortable every time. And I also bring my own lunch bag with my own lunch box, as well as I have this one, uh, utensil, which we have two ends, a bog end and a spoon end, so I can wash something, uh, I can use it every day. And I also have something really cool that I've been trying recently, is that I, oh, I have my reusable bag for sure, is actually made from one of my colleagues here at the Vancouver Aquarium, so I can put my bread and also food inside. And also, I have this one, which is really cool. It's a multifunctional wrap. Um, so I brought it uh, in Hong Kong. Uh, I can put my bread there. So what I do is, for example, I have my bread here. So I would try to wrap it, wrap it, wrap it, wrap it, wrap it. And then I would try to close it with my so I can actually uh, buy food and wrap it here or even it's a rainy day uh, if your umbrella is wet I can actually put it inside and prevent it to uh, prevent the rainwater to leak out and is re reusable so I won't really need to use any single use plastics and recently I've trying to do uh, use this one as well so bear with me for a second so try to guess what it is a cool flute. <laughs> so um, that this is actually straw made from bamboo. So instead of using single use uh, plastic straw, I've been tr trying to get these and then bring it with me every day so that when I want to drink some cold drinks, I will use my um, my reusable bottles as well as my straw here so that I can reduce the use of any plastics as well. And during these stay home period, of course I stay home sometimes as well. So I've made myself a reusable bag here. So it's actually made from your old t-shirt. So I just grabbed one of my old t-shirt and I try to cut the collar, I try to uh, try to cut it, uh, cut the sleeves off, and then I try to cut uh, the bottom of the t-shirt uh, into strips like this, and then I try to tie it together. So after that, you will get a nice bag with your own beautiful pattern. Uh, mine is with the cats in it, and I will try to put all my things inside, and this is my shopping bag and grocery bag. 
every day. Yeah, so I got a lot of things here and some of my friends, um, not in Hong Kong, but somewhere uh, in Malaysia, they're trying to do some cool projects as well. So um, they're trying to make their own biological plastics out of cornstarch as well. So this is something I want to challenge you for today. Uh, so try to use cornstarch, try to search online for some uh, biological plastic recipe and try to make it uh, at, in your, at your home during this period and try to invent something really cool and share with us. And uh, the more we know, the more creative we are, we can try to help our environment a bit, a, a bit more and more and more. And yeah, don't forget to share the things that you've learned today. Try to really find some reusable items to start with. Even though you're not in coastal area, these kind of items can, eat, can actually help you to protect the environment with us. Yeah, so these are the bags or even you can make your own. It's very easy. And don't forget to learn more about plastic and also um, the ocean as well. So we do have um, education platform for you to learn more about the ocean. So I will type it in later. It's called literacy.ocean.org. So from there, you can interact with our educators. You can post things on there. You can try to play games and videos. And yeah, we have a lot of resources for you during this period of time. We all uh, are free right now, but you can also initiate your own project at home too. <laughs> Woo, you covered the gamut, Nicole. That was awesome. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, that's the benefit of this, this topic is that it's a big issue. It's a huge issue. It affects us all. Literally, wherever you are in the world, the stuff that you create does end up in the ocean. That is the simple fact of it. But there are so many things you can do at home to make a big difference. And so uh, in addition to all the resources Nicole has mentioned, I passed along a few in the YouTube chat bar. National Geographic has a major campaign to fight ocean plastics. You can check out the link there of things you can do at home. And she mentioned literacy.ocean.org. OceanWise in general is the most robust, amazing ocean education resource in the world. So you can go on their website, education.ocean.org. You can check out their plastics page, sustainable seafood, whatever you want to learn about the ocean, how you can make a positive difference. It's all there on their website. You just need to track it down. Again, some of those links are there. So I encourage you to do that uh, the moment you're done this presentation. I've also passed along a link to a few of the, the names of people you can check out that we've had at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants to learn even more about this issue and what you can do. Nicole, this has been fantastic. I know you've listed a few cool resources. Is there anything else that we can share with kids that you know uh, that might encourage them to take action when they're done? Yeah, for sure. So try to change your ideas in a very good way in order to protect the environment. And uh, another way is to support the scientists in doing more conservation research program as well. So for OceanWise at the Vancouver Aquarium, they're still going to do a lot of different kind of research, not only for uh, microplastic or plastics con uh, distribution, but also for other marine animals as well. So your support is very important. So if you would like to uh, try to support us, by donation because we're actually having a limit resources, but we're trying to really provide a lot of different kind of resources for you. So if you would like to support us, thank you very much. And yeah, stay tuned and we will try to deliver more programs as well as more to bring you more uh, education resources as well. Fantastic. And you can certainly check out all our past OceanWise sessions on Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants YouTube channel. You can subscribe to us on YouTube, check us out on social media, or donate if you like what we're doing on our website. So I encourage you to check that out. Nicole, what we do at the end of every broadcast, as you know, is I'm going to demute everyone's microphone. So all our live groups joining us, uh, you are all now demuted. If you want to join me and say a huge thank you to Nicole for joining us today, go for it. Thank you so Thanks, much. Nicole. Thanks, Nicole. That was fantastic. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Uh, all right. Uh, for all our groups joining at home, thanks so much for keeping the learning alive as you guys are stuck at home. We really appreciate it. Nicole, awesome as always, and looking very forward to having you back soon. Yeah. All right. Have a wonderful rest of your day, everyone. Bye for now, guys. See you all.